to continue. You won't by word or facial expression or in any other way ask anyone to be nice to you, to treat you right, to be kindly to you. Not only will they treat you all wrong, but you have already kept yourself in the state of, teach, of, of keep teaching yourself bad ways to live. I could have phrased that better. The very asking of that is weakness. Why do you want anyone to be nice to you? Why do you want anyone to love you? Are you worth loving? Hmm? Come on now, look inside yourself and you tell me whether you're worth loving or not. That trash is worth loving. Then what on earth are you doing asking people to, to treat you nicely? What you hope is that they won't see through you and you'll, pr you'll pretend and go along with the game. You won't see through, to them, through them either. And so you can play the game until you fight. When are you going to fight? Do you know why you fight with other people, by the way? Well, because you're both fighters. Because you're both weak. Because neither, neither of you has the courage to use that energy you use in fighting to make yourself strong. So that you can associate with everyone on earth, every, if you could, you know, couldn't do it physically. You could associate with anyone on earth and never fight with anyone. You could be with the worst super sicky in, in the country or the nicest person in the country and everywhere in between and never, 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 ever have a quarrel with anyone. Do you know why? <sighs> this is beautiful. Because you're living from strength. From real strength that says says by your manner, by your facial expression, by your words, by everything that says, look, I have discovered a few things. I understand a few things. And that understanding is not my strength, the Vernon or Murray or Alan has no strength. But that understanding has given me a certain strength. And that is what you are going to have a relationship with if you're going to have one with me. Now, if you don't want it, goodbye. No quarrel, right? Right? right, right. Take it or leave it. Where's the quarrel? Well, if they go away, fine. Still no quarrel. Have you remained strong? Have you remained true? Have you refused to, to compromise? Now, we used to do that, didn't we? Till we get sick and tired of it. Till we, we thought we had to do it. Uh, then we got a little bit smart. Oh. <coughs> but the person says, whether it's a relative, friend, whoever, anyone in the world, anyone in the world, says, well, I'd like to stay with you. Don't trust them. They're lying. Parts of them are lying. And you try the spirits to see whether they be true or not. And that's easy to do. All you have to do is remain strong. Remain in command of yourself. That's all. It's uh, no work worth the work. Truth has done it already. It's been done since the beginning of time. It's all been done. So if you remain there, is not all the courage to use that word, cosmic courage, now that's a little bit, all that cosmic courage, all that perfect confidence, all that certainty that doesn't have to give an inch because it's got the whole world already. So you keep an eye, you see, on everybody you meet, every organization you get into, which is simply made up of individuals, of course. You keep your eye on everybody you meet and then if you stay strong while watching them, you will know, you will see rather, you will see how this new strength, this higher strength behaves toward the super sicky, toward the person who's working on himself a little bit, toward the crying woman, toward the hateful man, toward the little child. Doesn't your life become effortless then? Because you're not living your own life anymore.
you understand that's your problem, don't you? Mm -hmm. That you're living your life, huh? Well, now you have heard in the last few minutes how to live a problem-free life. Someone's going to cause you trouble? What, what, I, don't, I don't understand. How can you cause me trouble? I don't, I don't get it. What can you do against me? What can you do? I, I don't get it. If you're going to come after me with a club, I'll duck, of course. But what are you going to do to me psychologically? There's nothing you can do. Boy, I'll tell you, you'll scare the life out of the devil, literally, when you see this and then say it. See, the devil, the devil, you, you, you'll know what I'm talking about, don't you? The devil in human beings is always very carefully sizing you up. He's looking at your face, he's looking at the flicking eyebrows, eyelashes. He's watching whether your hands are going like that or not. He's watching very, very carefully everything you do. But there's one disadvantage. There's one thing he can't do. He can't do a thing about it unless you are one of his own. If you're not one of his own and you're wide awake there, you're conscious, you're awake, what's going to happen? Can the darkness enter the light? Can darkness enter light? No. So we've simplified everything we do in life, have we not? Oh, all we have to do is stay in the light. And that's what we're after here. Then you can let anybody size you up and you know they're doing it because they don't know that you know. That policeman who stopped you, he doesn't know that you know. Mm. That relative, he doesn't know that you know. So he's going to try to grab you, isn't he? Maybe make you feel you know, little things, just little things, little subtle things. You know that you know that brother-in-law of yours, who by the law of accident and got the factory and he's the head president of it and makes a million dollars a year, and he lets you know it, huh? Is he trying to make you jealous or something? And you make fifty dollars a week, and you live all alone, and he has a wife and five children, and it's a a horrible home where they're always fighting, but he doesn't tell you that. He puts on a good front at the family gathering, doesn't he? <coughs> but you know that. You're awake. It doesn't make any difference to you. They don't know that. The world doesn't know it. The world doesn't care. They know nothing of these things. So we sit back. All right, let me read something to you. We, uh, we can get pretty rough here at times, as you know. And that's good and necessary and will continue. But every once in a while, on rare occasions, we talk about beautiful things. <clears throat> pretty things. And tonight we're going to do that. We're going to take a long leap from one end of things to the other, as you'll see. This, write it down if you want, but it's a bit too much maybe to write down. Follow carefully. I'll read it <coughs> twice. And try to see something in every sentence. The condemnation I feel for being evil comes only from evil itself. Repeat. I'm going to go real slow. Don't miss this. The condemnation I feel for being evil comes only from evil itself. Comma. Never from God. The condemnation is nothing more than the unnatural storm arising from my present confused nature. This means that the curse on me comes from me, period. That can be corrected because I need not remain what I am. I'll read that whole sentence over, then go on to two more. 
The condemnation I feel for being evil comes only from evil itself, never from God. The condemnation, it, don't you ever feel that God is condemning you? It's impossible. God knows nothing. Truth knows nothing. Reality knows nothing of condemnation. That's a negative factor. It's a divisive factor. Here is God condemning you, the sinner, and that doesn't exist. There is no God and a sinner. The sinner thinks so and cries out to his idea of God in order to try to find his kind of false salvation. God knows nothing of condemnation. Our false nature does, however. The, conde the condemnation I feel for being evil comes only from evil itself, never from God. The condemnation is nothing more than the unnatural storm arising from my present confused nature. This means that the curse on me comes from me. Now you know what to do, don't you? You're not going to sit down and feel that God up there or the devil over there in a distinct form is going to condemn you and send you to hell. Why do you like to think that? You love it or you wouldn't think it. How many of you think you're going to hell with hell fire and a pitchfork? It may be very deep in your subconscious. If you think you're going to hell, you're not going anywhere. You're already there. Mm. Correct? Right. Correct? This means that the curse on me comes from me. That can be corrected because I need not remain what I am. Next paragraph. A contrite heart has earned the privilege of being scolded by truth. A contrite heart has earned the privilege of being scolded by truth. This steadily removes the curse, or rather the illusion of the curse. This steadily removes the curse. A truly humble spirit, which is a truly strong spirit, knows no curse. Let me stop there. You see, we use the word curse, and you think of a vampire in a movie, right? You think about condemnation. You think of how your father bawled you out for something. Let's pause long enough to examine carefully. You examine carefully how much you feel inside yourself that you are condemned by practically everything, including yourself. Want to phrase it a different way? The world is against me. There's, there's a great oppressiveness. I am the center of condemnation. People disapprove of me, and I disapprove of myself. A great, great giant, capital C, condemnation. And I can tell by your faces that this is the way you feel. All right, switch the word just a little bit from condemnation to curse you get a little religious about it now you feel cursed feel cursed by god you feel cursed by mankind you feel cursed just by living you must be cursed considering all the things that happen to you someone's cursing you but you don't know who to blame so you take whatever you want if you're religious then it's the devil if you want to make a lot of money then it's the boss who's cursing you or whatever you know, curse. You know, you know, what condemnation is. It's a word. Condemnation is a word that you take as a reality, and when you set off the word condemnation, you activate all your associations. The word condemnation, and as a child, you saw the man in hell. You saw uh, someone condemned in a movie to Devil's Island, and it activates condemnation. And then you apply it to yourself because you apply everything to yourself. Isn't everything self-centered? Don't all roads lead to you? Huh? Come on. You try sometime with this one word, and then you can go on to 50,000 other words, depending on your vocabulary. You take the one word condemnation, and first of all, you see how... Oh. Condemnation, I know what that means. That means self-condemnation. See? See? You won't let yourself alone for one minute, will you? You'll nag yourself, you'll drag yourself into it all the time. Because this is your world, the world of your self-centeredness. And you'd rather be condemned than be left alone. I'll read that second paragraph once more. A contrite heart has earned the privilege of being scolded by truth. This steadily removes the curse. 
a truly humble spirit, which is a truly strong spirit, knows no curse. Can you imagine reality living under condemnation, or is it living free? It is living free. Last paragraph, which says summary. Summary. A curse or a condemnation is nothing more than a demonic, than demonic whisperings. I, I want to pause. You're going to miss it unless you connect this with what happened to you the last week, the last month, all your life. Please connect it with what has happened to you as follows. A curse or a condemnation is nothing more than demonic whisperings which gleefully hope that I will listen, tremble, and become one of them by believing in their lies. A curse or a condemnation is nothing more than a demonic whisperings, demonic whisperings, which gleefully hope that I will listen, tremble, and become one of them by believing in their lies. I'm going to tell you a personal story in connection with that. A long time ago, when I lived in Los Angeles, and was living with a family, my family, there was a neighbor next door who was a, a super sickie. He did dreadful things all around. He put his radio under the opposite neighbor's window and turned it up loud just to annoy him, and they called the police name. A dreadful man. And in those days, I didn't understand as much about human nature as I do now. Uh, so I didn't handle it rightly, but the situation was as follows, and you'll see why, how it connects with this. Mm -hmm. One day there some, came some kind of a misunderstanding, and he came over, some children or something were throwing rocks out in the street, and he came over to complain, and not in a nice way, but you know, stuff that I'm going to call the police, things like that. And incidentally, he was a man who was always threatening to call the police, and people were always calling the police on him. Do you see the connection? You see the connection? You see? You see it? All right. So he came over, and very angry, and and uh, he was a paranoid. That's the proper word. He, he was suspicious. Everybody was trying to do something again. So the ladies in the family, started in my family, started to cry, a couple of them there. And... Uh, I was sitting back, it was in the living room, he had just come in the house and was complaining and yelling and screaming. And the ladies in my family started to cry. And I was standing a little, a little bit of a distance where I could see everything that was going on. And I tell you, in the three seconds, what I saw was worth a ten-year course in human nature, the psychology of human nature. Here's the process. He screamed. The lady started to cry. I looked at his face and I saw the most evil happiness I've ever seen on the face of a human being. He smiled at their suffering that he had caused a disturbance. And ever run into this yourself? Yes. Have you ever caught that particular expression on a person's face? Mm -hmm. All right, in that case, I can read the sentence over and it may perhaps mean a little more. A curse or a condemnation is nothing more than, a de than demonic whisperings which gleefully hope that I will listen, tremble, and become one of them by believing in their lies. You understand that, that you do indeed become one of the imps, the negative forces, the demons, when you accept their lies, right? Are they not on the same level? Are you not worshiping that evil man by getting mad at him? Huh? by being afraid of it. Therefore, very simple, I'm on the same level of anyone that I get angry at. Okay. All right, I'll start over and I'll read the whole thing complete for now. Summary. A curse or a condemnation is nothing more than demonic whisperings which gleefully hope that I will listen, tremble, and become one of them by believing in their lies. Sorry, but I will no longer fall for it. I don't have to. Truth said so. Truth alone is now my source of instruction. So all is well. I rest all is well now and forever. And I'll say amen to that.
that? Yes. Jean will make, I guess she'll make a copy. Let's read the last part again. I said it was beautiful news, didn't I? <coughs> Sorry, but I will no longer fall for it. You had better get some feeling in that. Don't you mutter mouth. No, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. <coughs> You had better feel what you say with a new and higher kind of feeling. Otherwise, you're just trying to talk yourself into it and it won't work, will it? Sorry, but I will no longer fall for it. I don't have to. Truth said so. Truth alone is now my source of instruction. So all is well. I rest. All is well now and forever. <coughs> Boy, I'll tell you, aren't we going out of here new people? Oh, look, I'll fight for you if you'll let me. Will you let me? Hmm? You can fight for yourself or against yourself. I'm trying to get you to fight for yourself in the right way to stop being a sniveling little weasel coward which is what you now are I'm not condemning you I'm not insulting you I'm stating the fact of your nature now and you know it's that way because you're, play, you're, you're paying the price for it you're suffering from it You can conquer the world. All right. For some of you who understand where you're going to start the conquest. Mm. This is the only world I have to conquer. You, you see, look, look, what, look at the mistake you're making. How many have been mad today? How many have been afraid today? Irritable, crabby, unpleasant, sour, dumb. <laughs> All right. I, I, I've, I've flattered you by calling you weasel cowards. <laughs> You worshipped that anger in you, and you worshipped that nut human being that you feared. How many were afraid of someone in the last month? Come on, everybody raise your hand. All right. Oh, oh, someone come in. Yeah. Oh, hold it. Hold it. Take a break. You worship what you presently are. Examine yourself and see what you presently are. And this is what you bow down to all day long. You're asking, for example, when you, when you get irritable, if you're a little crab, let's see the little crabs again. I want to spot you as if I didn't know. <laughs> You're worshiping that crabbiness, making it your idol. You know why you do that? Just so you can be your own idol. You love yourself. How many of you in love with yourself? Huh? Pretty sick love affair, huh? <laughs> you worship what you are. Find out for yourself what you've been worshiping all day today. This is the worship of division. That is, you have certain ideas about yourself. And these ideas are being worshipped. This is the worship of division, where there's you and something to worship. You're worshipping your self-images, your self-pictures. You're worshipping your ambitions. You're worshipping the power you have over someone, wife, husband, children, whatever. You're worshipping your dreams of future grandeur, right? You're worshipping all these things. All right. This is idol worship. It can't be anything else because it's of the division of the intellect. True worship goes on, proceeds without the word. 
The minute you introduce the word in it, you've introduced you as the worshiper and something to worship, right? And will always be false. Religious people are always worshiping something false because they are worshiping the, the, the label, the word God, Christ, or whatever it is. And they, they don't know that they're worshiping a word and they never believe it in a thousand years. Real worship has no word to it <coughs> because real worship is a state. And it's a state of one thing where there's no division at all. Where there's no me to worship everything. Anything. Anything. There's no me to worship, to look to anything. I have no heroes anymore. Oh, you're going to be pained in giving up your heroes, aren't you? Those here and those there. There is great joy, great pleasure, and great happiness in not looking to anyone else for power. Not having anyone to worship. You know why? You've got it all. I said you've got it all. There's no intellect operating to say I am weak and therefore I will look to someone else to be strong. I'll look to the church, I'll look to the religious book, I'll look to the class. There is silence, intellectual silence, emotional silence. And in that silence is the strength of the universe. You're one with yourself, therefore not divided by ideas. Therefore, not seeking anything at all. Because the kingdom of heaven within, which is complete, does it have to seek anything? Does it want anything? You're going to have to get tough. Boy, you're going to have to get tough. If you think you're tough now, that's your idea of being tough, which is cowardice and weakness. You're not tough at all. You're weak and you're scared and you're miserable. I'll re I'll reread the key line about getting tough. You listen. <clears throat> Sorry, but I will no longer fall for it. Your prince of insight is telling the criminal you're not going to fall for it anymore. You don't have to. Truth said you don't have to do it. Don't you say it because you don't know. But this higher understanding with a capital U knows automatically without trying. Let the world, let, let all four billion human beings on earth surround you at once, scream at you, accuse you, curse you, condemn you, and you just sit there, you just sit there and look at them and you know they're insane. You do the same thing you do when you go down to the monkey cage, down at the zoo. They're jumping around, they're screaming and they're hollering and all, and they're putting their hands out for peanuts. You just sit there and you understand. You're untouchable. God is untouchable. Truth can't be touched by falsehood. Isn't that beautiful? Hmm? Did you ever hear anything more beautiful? This can be your beauty. Then you won't have to use the word except when you're communicating with other people. Please, please, get tough. You don't have to be weak and cringing toward anything inside you or outside you. And the things inside you you've been cringing before for how many years? Remember when your parents slapped you? Remember when your father slapped you in front of your, your three school chums who you came home from school with and he came out and he slapped you for not doing this or for doing... Remember that, huh? You know, mm -hmm, yeah. similar. You remember that, don't you? You don't have to cringe before that, but you don't know you're doing it. I'm telling you, you don't know it.
it's a major principle that what is in con unconscious in us must be brought up to consciousness. What is deep and dark inside of us must be brought up by our understanding, brought up so that we can see it and expose the fact that it has no real power at all. It has power because it is unconscious, unseen. It churns down there. The animals live, the wild animals live down in the dungeon and you're up on the ground floor and you are afraid because you hear the growls and the howls and the moans down there and you don't understand what it is you, you you don't understand what's making all those sounds down there and so you don't investigate and so you live in terror on that floor day and night day comes when you're scared of living in terror so you open the trap door and you walk down turn the flashlight down and you see that they're just animals down there who can't touch you because you are more intelligent than the animals Oh, you didn't know that, did you? You thought you... Of course, you are as stupid as the animals. You and the animals are one. But there's something that is not you that is a million times more intelligent than the animals that can outwit them every time without even thinking about it. It's no contest. Its score is a million to zero. But you have to have the courage to open the trap door and put the light down there and see that that snarling tiger is very, very stupid beast. He's very stupid. He really is. That gorilla who's been beating his chest and rumbling down there. He's, you're, you're smarter than a gorilla, are you not? But you'll only see that when you point the light and see what's going on down there and identify them as animals. To switch to the illustration, don't you call devils intelligent? You call them intelligent because you've called yourself intelligent because you identify with them and want want to be in an intelligent devil. Yes. Huh? You want to be an intelligent devil, huh? It, the devil can never be anything but stupid. This is why he has no chance at all against God, against truth. All right. A couple more words and then we'll stop. I'll write it down, please. It will be done for me. It will be done for me. Let's take a 10, 12 minute break. Make a comment if you wish. Yes, Linda. From what you said tonight, and something I've been thinking about for a long time, it seems that I personally have to get much more aggressive towards this work. Ah, that's very good. The right kind of aggressiveness, yeah. right? Yes, you're all passive because there's a certain false comfort in just sitting back and not fighting. You had better start battling in a way you never ever battled before. You see, we misunderstand things and we go into images that I'm, well, I'm not a, an aggressive person, I'm just peaceful. I just sit back, you know. Fight for yourself. Yes, Frank. Would this be proper work? On the thought of fear of death, I'll ponder my death, and then it brings about fear. Now what I do then is try to separate and observe this fear. Yes, and what is the cause of the fear of anything at all? Why do you separate the fear of death from the fear of an angry husband, of a shrewish wife? of the world. Why do you, why, why are there two, there's only one fear, one basic fundamental fear, which then expresses itself in a thousand ways. What's the cause of fear? The cause of fear is you or me trying to convince ourselves that our separate self is real. It is not real and will be in fear and trembling as long as we try to quote mark prove it because it can't be proven. You can't prove that an illusion is true. 
You can't prove that that mirage has water in it. You go out and try to swim in it or drink it, and you'll see whether you can get any comfort from it or not. We have to stop calling the mirage water. That'll scare you because then you're going to say, where am I going to drink? Never mind where you're going to drink. Atheists ask, where am I going to drink? People with, and I vow this is the first and last time I'll use this word here, people with real faith don't ask questions. You see, we ask questions of God based in our own insecurity and worse yet, based in our own concepts of what God is going to do for us. Aren't you a little bit disturbed and ah, uh, and a little bit bitter and a little bit uh, nervous over the fact that your prayers are never answered, never have been answered? Religious people will tell you that their prayers were answered, which is composed partly imagination, partly accidental factors that happen the way they happen to want them to happen, partly vanity and most of all the wish to live in illusion of them being a child of God. If you think you're a child of God, you're a child of the devil. What do you think of that? If you think you're a child of God, you're a child of the devil. All children of who call, people who call themselves children of God are children of the devil. You understand that or not? Mm -hmm. yeah. Huh? I saw hands. Uh, Gordon, I guess. I was just connecting uh, that I have apparently always gotten proof of my existence because everybody else, including my family or the world, believes the same illusion. Yes. So you swallowed it whole. Did we communicate on that, Gordon? Yes. Okay. Amy. Before the meeting, you talked about the man and woman in the boat who made thirty-two thousand dollars. Remember the example? Y yes, right. Does that, or how would that connect with this sentence you uh, gave us a long time ago? Every time I achieve something, I push the future farther away. Yes, because the, your happiness is falsely invested in time materiality make that a hyphenated word I guess your future happiness is invested in a time materiality that is I've got the money I've got the girlfriend boyfriend I've got the boat whatever come that is going to give me happiness in the future I've got it right now as a physical possession but now I am going to ride that boat out on every sun on Sunday and bring my friends along and brag that I have a boat it's going to make me happy. I push, I push authentic happiness farther away because I've simply filled up my psychic space with illusory happiness based in time. If you are not happy right now, right now at 10 minutes to 8, when are you going to be? You tell me why you are going to be happy and what's going to make you happy tomorrow or next year, and you'll tell a lie. If you could drop all your ideas about future happiness, you'd have it now. It's your ideas about happiness that is making you unhappy. And it's your ideas about avoiding misery in the future that is making you miserable now. Time is created by the mind, past and future. If you cancel that, would there be any you who was beaten by your mother, by your father, beaten by society and is therefore suffering? If you cancel time by not existing as a time self, would you not be free right now and therefore have no future and no need for one? Heaven is now. Hell is now. Hell being time, authentic heaven being non-time. Isn't that simple? Mm -hmm. uh, one, two. Living out of time, I have no past 
and no future. Nope. Therefore, I, I, I consciously am what I am supposed to be. Yes, but there's no you to even think about that. Yeah. Yeah. You said there's no past and there's future. There's not even you. Yeah. Right? There's no you to be concerned of. We are concerned over <coughs> our illusions. Mm -hmm. Now, how's that mm -hmm. for wasted energy? We worry over falsehood. How's that for living unwisely? Chuck, I think. You've given us exercises on, on tension, you know, on how to defy tension. I'm getting more tense. Uh, it's getting very unbearable at times. Yes. You know what, Chuck? It's going to scare you to death to relax. You're so unfamiliar with the state. You're going to have to dis <laughs> Listen, isn't this curious? Not only, Chuck. We're going to have to descend into the hell of letting go of our hell in order to feel the, re the reality, the naturalness of just physical relaxation. We might as well do it now. If you haven't been doing it all along, the jaw a little bit loose, and the hands loose, and the mind relaxed, and yet very, very flexible and alert, not having any concern, because there's no one there to be concerned over, huh? Hmm? You don't believe in words anymore, you don't believe in labels anymore. You don't believe in descriptions anymore. Yes, Linda, back there. Is that what you do when you feel tenseness? Sit back and relax. Is that the exercise? What'd she say? She says, "Is that what you do? What you should do when you feel tenseness? Sit back and relax." Yes. Are you able to do that, or will you try? If that's the proper exercise, I'll try. Oh yes. Doesn't well, you notice the shock it'll give you. You won't want to do it. In fact, you you will resist it so badly, you'll forget it 99 out of 100 times that you try. You'll forget it because tension has false value to it. It fills up. Listen to this. Tension fills up a lot of space. It makes me feel directionful that I'm going somewhere, that I'm doing something, that I am somebody. Do you think that that tension is going to let you go easily? Not at all, because it's afraid of losing itself. There's, the, you're afraid of letting go of what has been falsely valuable valuable to you all the time. Yes, please. It's a powerful drug, too. That's good. Description, drug. Yes, Chuck. Is it, is it uh, at time proper to uh, ride the, ten the tension out, say like you're in bed and it's very tense? And you can't do the exercise. What do you mean, write it out? <laughs> just observe it. Just, just go with it. Well, of course. <coughs> well, look. Your tension, being a mechanical force, will naturally go away of itself. Because maybe, after, excuse me, after being tense for a little bit, you're invited to the party and you dance around and get all loose and flexible and all that. You're not tense then, are you? But this happened mechanically. You didn't do any work. You're, you're going to go back to being tense after you leave the, the party, right? Are you not? Because you're simply on the mechanical level of opposites. But while you're tense and you interrupt it with knowledge that you're tense, you could just, just see yourself going like that, not resisting it not doing anything about it except seeing which is doing you do that and that's the log in front of the rushing truck that causes a, a shock and that shock slows down the truck just a little bit you do that over and over and over and over now something higher than the tension itself is operating on it tension cannot end tension obviously satan can't cast out satan Go ahead and change it. Sure. You are loaded with guilt, aren't you? Come on. Nod your head. You're just loaded with guilt. Now, 
Do you suppose that has some connection with this curse and condemnation we talked about? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Right. All right, apply guilt to it. Just substitute the word guilt for curse or condemnation. Uh, Rudy. I even felt guilt when you said, this is a very light story, a very nice story, and I felt guilt because I was not able to feel the lightness or the, the niceness of the story. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you of a success I had today in self-observation. Then we'll go on. But believe me, it's little things like this that does it. A hundred little things a day. I have uh, two dictionaries at home, the same set. One from A to L or whatever, halfway in them. A to L and the other one from M, uh, M to the uh, Z. And they're both down in a little desk uh, next to the right of where I work. And they, they have the covers are off, so there's no easy way I can tell whether it's the first volume or the second volume. So today I needed to look up a word. So I reached down, and first I saw my hope that the word I wanted was in the one I accidentally grabbed. <laughs> I picked it up, and it wasn't, and I watched my disappointment <laughs> that I had to reach for the second one. <laughs> How's that for catching the devil in the act, huh? A disappoint devil of disappointment. All right, somebody. Yes, Ron. What you said about condemnation and the curse is the most beautiful thing I think I've ever heard. It is beautiful, isn't it? Because of the truth behind it. Wednesday night when you came in, in your rageful mood, if there had been no curse, no self-reference, it'd be nothing to me. Right. You did it to me again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You don't know what you're going to have to go through. I'm doing my best to put you through it. Yeah. I tell you to do this and you do that. How are you going to learn? So slow down, please. Go ahead, Alan. Okay. Right. After having a successful event of self-observation, what happens now? What happens as a result of that? Understanding, understanding the nature of what you observed. Yes, or right. What I'm trying to ask is, essence finds something out about itself. Essence and develops further. Would that be right to say that? Uh, I, I don't get your words, Frank. Me, let's say it that way. Well, let's start over, Frank. I'm right. sorry. As a result of a successful self-observation. All right. All right. The undeveloped part of me knows something more and develops a little bit more as a result of that? Uh, no. no. It's always a question of dissolving. Okay. Dissolving the mechanical habit. Now, the next time I reach for that dictionary, I'm going to be aware to see if there's... A, why should there be even the smallest amount of of disappointment in me, or maybe I'm physically tired, that would be legitimate. If it's just that I'm, I don't want to rush, that isn't legitimate. But next time I'll be very aware, if I get the right one or wrong one, I'll, I'll watch my state. Uh, slow down, we're going too fast. I want to interrupt this mad rush of learning we're having here. All right, anybody? Yes, Richard. When you gave the example of that neighbor when you were with your family. Yes. 
It reminded me of an incident in my life where Richard did the very same thing. And when you said that, I went into sh there was shame over right. having done that. Is right. that a, a correct step or? No, the shame itself was wrong. Did you see yourself feeling shame? Yeah. Um, well, the shame came up on as you were giving the example. Well, did you know that you were in a state of shame? Could you see it coursing through you or not? Yes. Or were you one with it? Okay, I was one with it. Well, it has to be one or the other. You said two things that are contradictory. Which is it? Or don't you know? Okay, I was the shame. Pardon? I was the shame. Okay, then you didn't observe it. You didn't see it. But now you're talking about it. Now you can think about it and see that you were in the wrong state then. And that's, that's instant recovery in a, a way of it. Yes, Linda. I observe that I am, if people ask me questions, I like go someplace to apply for a phone, or if they ask me questions, I become very, very irritated. I don't know if it's a problem, but just seeing that irritation when people ask me questions that will help overcome it. You feel threatened by the whole world, don't you, Linda? For some reason, obviously. Yes, everybody's out to get you, right? Huh? Pretty miserable, huh? Yes. Uh, we'll teach you better. But is seeing that constant irritation, will that help me to stop it? Yes, yes it will. Seeing the constant irritation is the first step to ending it. Don't like to be irritated. You're in love with your irritation, aren't you? I must be. It happens frequently. Yeah. Your irritation is your happiness. Figure that out with any of us. My unhappiness is my happiness. <clears throat> Warren, I feel so trapped by Irene myself. And there's a part of me that wants so, or it seems to, to take the courage to make the steps to break my mechanical, you know, to make some attempts. And Irene is such a coward and I'm seeing this more and more, and it's so so difficult to do even the smallest things outside of my normal habit pattern or normal way of behaving. What I'm asking is maybe some helpful techniques. Irene, we've known each other quite a while, haven't we? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, Irene, I haven't been able to help you very much because you would cry. I, I could say things to you right here now, for example, or even in private, which I won't. Irene, you can't take it. When are you going to learn to take it? Huh? You'd, you'd, you'd be so upset and so angry and confused. I'm talking to all of you, but I'm talking to her now. Don't you know that I know you can't take it? <coughs> I see tears to come to your eyes. Some of you men, I'd, because you're, you're afraid of me, you'd, you wouldn't cry, but you, you'd have your particular reactions toward me. You wouldn't be angry toward me now because you, you'd be afraid of me to get angry. But if you have something good in you, if you have something good in you at the same time that 99% of you is going through hell, 1% would sense that what was said to you was to help you not to hurt your feelings. We're not here to hurt anyone. We never have hurt anyone, and we never will hurt anyone. Even though I go through superiority and hostility and then guilt and resentment and all those things, but it still boils down to I'm reinforcing my sick ego. All of them are reinforcements of the sick ego. Yeah, yeah, right. Even if it's self-pity, it's course. still reinforcement. Of course, of course. Write down a sentence. I conquer it by going through it. 
I conquer it by going through it. I conquer it by going through it. That's understandable, isn't it? Huh? Hmm? Yeah. I changed my mind. Pardon? I changed my mind. Don't you let anybody condemn you. Don't you let anybody ridicule you. Some of you are in a stage where if someone ridicules you, laughs at you, you weakly grin back at them and try to toss it off because you're afraid of that person. God help you if you ever do that again. Don't you ever put up with some nut, some idiot making ridiculous, ridiculing remarks at you, cutting remarks. You look at them, or you say, use your judgment now, use your proper judgment, don't be stupid about it, but either inwardly or outwardly, you say to that person, now you just knock it off, that's the last, I'm going to take that nonsense from you, you either behave properly with me or get out. Get out of my life. I have grinned weakly, secretly resenting your remarks long enough. Now knock it off, and if you don't get it, I'll tell you a couple more times, and then goodbye. Straighten up or get out of my life. Don't you dare put up with that anymore. Anyone making fun of you. Not from your ego, you understand, but because a new strength is developing in you that doesn't permit sick people to feed off of you and destroy themselves too in the process. Don't you break down and grin ever again when someone ridicules you. You look at them solemnly. If you can do that right, that will be enough. And the time will come when they won't do it in the first place. Because the weak, sickly little cowards they are, they only attack people they know they can hurt. That's how sick they are. And when they meet someone who's genuinely strong, they want nothing to do with them, and they will hate you as a strong person. Because that's all they can do. <coughs> this happened to you, what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm people making fun at you, making cutting remarks. You have taken that. Now you listen to me. This is a class order. You have taken that for the last time. Now, you may make mistakes. You understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You may make mistakes in working on this, but you start. That's all you're asked to do to start. For, for once, maybe you could, the first time it happens, that big dumb bully, the stupid bully comes over and he does what he's been doing the last year or 20 years, whatever. The first time, maybe you'll forget, but then you'll remember that you forgot an hour later. The next time it happens, you, you catch it maybe halfway through, but it's too late and you're already distressed. And next time you'll catch it a little early, a little early. The time will come when the expression on your face, he's going to look at it and he's going to be very, very puzzled at what he sees there. You keep that up and you watch. You watch how he will have no choice but to knock it off. Boy, I tell you, you're going to see that there's an authentic, that, that there really is, there really is a strength of God in this world operating in human, in human individuals, not in the masses of human beings, but in you and you and you. Mm -hmm. You will be that strength, and you won't have to do a thing to hold it. It is there all by itself. 
Fern, and that's very true. Remember, many months ago, I talked to you about a situation with my father. Yes. And I've been working on this ever since then. And it's just unbelievable what's happened. And I've continued to work and follow your instructions in it. But he might attack everybody else verbally. But he doesn't come near me. He leaves me alone. And it's just unbelievable what's happened in the situation. Only as long as I stay consistent within myself. Yes. The minute I don't, then I ask for it. That's that right. I found out, too. That's another right. Thing. That's right. All my life I've wept and moaned and that people were coming after me, and I literally have held up a flag and asked for it. Right. You know that you're asking for it. I held up a flag and said, come right at me and yeah. do it to me. You betcha. And you're ceasing to ask yeah, for it, aren't no. you? It's no fun. Pardon? It's no fun. Right, right. See, you don't understand. So let me say it again. You don't have to be afraid of any other human being on earth. Now, don't you dare look for the exceptions. There are no exceptions. You don't have to be afraid of anyone on the face of this earth. Now, that's a fact. When I first came to this class, I used to talk in class to you and to other people as if I knew what I was talking about. And then you gave me some shocks and I was became very silent in class for a long time after that. I think that might have been a case where you gave me more than I could take. I was too weak. Did you bounce back from it? I, I think I'm trying to now. Yes. yes. Do you dislike me sometimes? Yes. You sense it, don't you? You sense it. The little bit of rightness that you sense in this room, you can have completely. If you'll let me knock you down. If you want to obey, if you want to obey your own present ordinary mind, you can do that if you want. If you want to worship that, which is the same as obeying it, then you can do that. But if you don't want to do that, then you can begin to obey something higher than that, which you don't understand yet because you don't have it in you as developed yet. Therefore, you have to permit someone else who does understand to blast you. If you resist the blasts, you can't grow. If you take it just as best you can in a small way. I'm sure you made a lot of mistakes, didn't you, at the start of your experiment with oh, your yes. father? Oh, yes. All right. If you work even, even in a small way to understand these things, then the light, which is not your teacher's light exclusively, obviously, becomes your light. There's plenty of light to go around mm -hmm. for those who want it. <clears throat> Yes, sir. The exercise you gave us last week to remember ourselves when we got out of our car, I've been trying to do that all week and usually failed. But what I've noticed is the momentum of my life, of my mind, and that's why I fail. Mm -hmm. Let me add to that then. For those of you who are new, we occasionally give the exercise of remembering yourself as you step into your car or step into your home, something like that. Now we'll add something else. Now you can go a little faster because here's something extra. You start off in the morning and assigning yourself some little simple one, something, something you always do. Well, you always walk through a doorway. You always pick up the coffee cup. You always put your coat on. You always go out the door endlessly all day long. You know you're going to pick sharp their pencil or whatever you do at the office. You know you're going to do a hundred things all day long. All right. 
all day long you will give yourself a little exercise right in front of you some distance it could be one minute it could be a half hour any time is all right I'm going to notice myself the next time I pick my pencil up off, off the disk all right whether you succeed or fail you will then give yourself the next one whether you succeed or fail you'll give yourself the next one and the very right idea of doing this will help you to remember the ones you failed because you'll be re keep it giving this this proper work memory inside of you alive and you'll say well the next one is oh, oh I forgot the last one see mm -hmm. All right, so you forgot the last. You do this all day long. Keep one up at, keep one ahead of you at all times and vary them as you wish. And you watch how your memory, that kind of work memory increases and you'll be able to do this more and more and more. You'll be you know what you'll be? This is proper de proper delight. Yes, Brittany. In in my life I have one person who, when you speak, when, when you're talking about distress and, and uh, with anyone, means one thing, I can't, I, well, means I can't take it, okay. This person is the only one in my mind that I have any trouble with. Everyone else in the world seems like I get along with, except this one person. In my mind. In your, I'm glad you said that. You see? Yes. What I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to hurt myself by using that one person and not looking at anyone else in the world. Right? Is this right? I really don't understand that. Okay. <clears throat> by, by using this one person as the only one that I have trouble with, I am overlooking everyone else. We work on everyone, everything. Well, I know that I, this is what I know, but I don't. I can't do it. Yes, I you can. I keep, I keep this one isolated, and this is the only one I, I. Are you living in imagination that you're even exercising with that one person? This I can't. I, this is what I'm. I'm mixed up about because in imagination I think I get along with everyone in the world, which I know I can't mm -hmm. do. How do you get along with Franny? I can't live with him three minutes by himself, period. That's it. Don't you know that you project that out to everyone in the world? Don't you know that, that Franey goes out and meets not just this one person, everyone else, and you see them as you are? You don't get along. You can't get along with anyone unless you're getting along with yourself. You can suppress yourself. You can keep your mouth shut. You can play it safe, but that's not getting along. That's that's unconscious suppression. You have to descend into the danger in order to destroy it, you know. You can't destroy the danger until you descend into it and see that it has no power outside of your own misunderstanding. But you have to come very close to it and you're afraid to do that for afraid those animals are going to get you. The animals have no way to get you. Not in reality. Go ahead, Tom. This is still Linda. Uh, Linda, are you there? Yes, Linda, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you ever drive the speed limits? No, I've tried. They're they, always burning late. Yeah, they exist for everyone but, but us, right? Right. Right. What did you say? Drive a what? Speed limits. Does a person ever drive the speed limits? Everybody exceeds the speed limits in the traffic because those those rules don't exist for me. You know what I'm saying? Oh, all right. That's it's this thing about to help slowing down. Yes. I wish I could see in myself the mistakes that I see in everyone else. Oh, you mean it's easier to see them in someone else? <laughs> <laughs> How true. Uh, I have some confusion between uh, 
suppression and trying and, and uh, shaking my head and saying stop. In other words, if there's something that I'm in that's uh, uh, off on a fantasy trip or whatever, or something that's causing me pain, and I stop it and put my mind to something else, I don't know if I'm just diverting, whether I'm suppressing, or whether I'm properly working. I've got confusion. Yes. Let me tell you what suppression is. Suppression, our picture our haunted house again. The haunted house has a dungeon down in it, way deep down in it. Suppression is dozens of little imps scurrying around down in the dark dungeon of the haunted house. And you and I, all our different eyes, are these little imps running around down there. Now, there's a part, there's something up in the haunted house that is the beginning of the prince. And the prince can come down and observe the scurrying little imps down there who, who have no other place to go. This is where they belong. This is where they belong down in there. But because they wreck the house and they groan and shriek and all that, because you don't want them anymore, I'm getting the illustration best I can, they can come down, the same with the tigers, and see them down there. They are not going to give up on themselves because they have no place to go. This is what they are. But they can be destroyed by something that is not them. What you are probably doing, what all human beings are doing, is that one little imp, they're running around in a big circle, and one little imp yells to another little imp, hey, we're bad. And the other one says, hey, we're bad. And the other one says, hey, we're bad. And then they all say in great glee, hey, we're black, bad. Isn't that fun? <laughs> but they won't change their nature. Only something up here which can see them can dissolve their nature. Suppression is simply an unwillingness to see what is inside us because it <coughs> violates, opposes, my image of being a good person in one way or another. <coughs> Murray. I guess it was Frank a while ago that was asking the question about once I catch myself through observation, but is that not finding out about Murray or Frank so that there's no division <coughs> So that there is oneness at that point? You're finding out what is called Frank. And what is Frank as far as this world is concerned. But it has nothing to do with the non-Frank who lives in eternity. Right now. Eternity is right now. Yes. But Murray has an image, for instance, that Murray is fearless. Okay. Which precipitates the fear. Yeah, yes, the, the image is the cause of fear. The right. image is the fear. Right. Because it's afraid of exposure. I can see now where my whole question in the beginning was from the wrong side of the wall. I'm trying to cultivate a thing that's already perfect rather than show something that doesn't exist that it doesn't exist. Ah, uh, now that was very good. Yes. yes. We've got five minutes more. Linda. There are several enlightened people on earth now. Is this the way it has always been? Yes. That there has always been a teacher on earth? Yes. I can, I can, without knowing it, I can tell you that. I never met them, but I know there were enlightened people, say, in 1540 and then 729, because the truth the truth comes down and keeps itself in certain individuals in order to keep evolution going. Mm -hmm. Christ wasn't the only awakened man. Buddha wasn't the only awakened man. Many of them are very obscure. Some of them, for example, just to pull an example out of the air, maybe an awakened person in the year 800 uh, came to a village somewhere and and attracted by his essence other people who were interested in the truth and maybe 10 people came and absorbed it 
and those ten, maybe one out of that ten, absorbed it thoroughly and became a teacher himself. Then he went somewhere. But all the time, people are being touched so that the truth remains alive in human form. Not really, of course, it's way up here. But it stays alive all the time and it's transmitted from one person to another. In, in um, personal contact or in books, and some cases maybe in drama. You can learn, you could learn a lot by watching drama if you know what to see. Because it is, not in every one of them of course, but uh, movies even, uh, if the author of that book, of the movie, he quite an unawakened man, and yet he has a certain knowledge of human nature, mm -hmm. and you want to know about human nature, you could learn from just watching that movie. Mm -hmm. If you want to learn more than you want to take sides on what happens in that movie. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that a year ago before I started with the class, my favorite evening's entertainment used to be to see get a box of Kleenex and get right into the television set, the drama, and I, you know, whatever, or if it was a tap dance and I was, you know, doing the whole number. And now when I watch it, I watch it on purpose to see how long it's going to take for the thing to take me over again, or if it's going to be able to take me over. And I use it as an instruction now. It's very good that way. Yes, it is. It is. It really is good. Use TV while you're, no matter what you're watching, use it. Mm -hmm. Watch liars, watch slanted news, watch anything. Yes, Jim? Well, along that line, there was an excellent commentary, I think it was a couple nights ago, on the industrialization of Japan and the intensity of the way they're going, that there is no relaxation. If they stopped, they would collapse. Yeah. Right. The whole thing, I mean, they're, they're just caught up in such a pace. It was just, you know, amazing the way it was portrayed. <clears throat> Final sentence, then we'll go home. Of two words. Love discomfort. Mm -hmm. Love discomfort. Good night. Good night.